Greetings and welcome to 303. We are in Senior English A, and we now are in your hymnals on page 252. I hope that you're there with me now. And our project now is to spend some time with the great Edmund Spencer. You can see dates over on page 253. We'll get there in a moment. We want to talk through, however, this preparing to read page first on 252. Let's just take some quick notes, shall we? Notice we're working at the top with connecting to the essential question. Like modern songwriters, Elizabethan poets use strongly emotional language to express their love. As you read, notice the different poetic forms these poets used to express love. So let's write this down really quickly. Right away, we're going to start dealing with the L word. Sorry about that for those of you who are skeptical of the concept. Okay, But in, um, in uh, 1600, which is the easy working date for the Renaissance I've given to you already, uh, they still believe in this concept called love. I'm obviously speaking a little bit ironic now, right? Notice the question, the essential question listed right there on 252. I would write this one down at level two. What is the relationship of the writer to tradition? What is the relationship of the writer to tradition? So we'll want to pay attention to this. Now I want you to jump to 2B really quickly, please. Literary analysis, and let's write down a couple of pieces of information. First of all, you definitely want this word sonnet there. Now I've already given you a lecture on the sonnet, that 14-line project, but let's review. The sonnet is a 14-line lyric poem. Let's write that down at 2B. 14-line lyric poem with a single theme, normally the theme of love. However, we'll see this change over time. Each line in a sonnet is usually in iambic pentameter. We want to write that down as well. Iambic pentameter. Ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. I've already kind of outlined this in earlier lectures. We'll come back to it as we study uh, Spencerian sonnets. All right? Notice uh, each line is usually iambic pentameter, five groups of two syllables, right? Each with the accent on the second syllable. Sonnet forms include these. Let's bullet point these two things. The Petrarchian sonnet, you definitely want that term at to be in your notes. You will see it, I promise you, on the exam. So you want to make sure that you've got a sense of it. The Petrarchian sonnet is divided into an eight-line octave. Rhyming A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, followed by a six-line sectet. Rhyming C, D, E, C, D, E. Often the octave poses a problem that is answered in the sextet. Contrasts between the octave and the sextet allow poets to develop meaning and achieve beautiful effects. Now, let's just put a note to ourselves right to the side there. That the Shakespearean sonnet form is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. I've already outlined this in an earlier lecture that you're familiar with. Here we're looking at the Petrarchian sonnet and notice that the, the rhyme scheme will be different and the division of the lines, therefore, also different. The Spencerian sonnet rhymes A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, C, D, C, D, E, E. And as I've already said to you, these... British writers of the Elizabethan era are playing the game of the Italian sonnet from a cat named Petrarch. That's why we call it Petrarchy. And what's going to happen is that they're going to play this game just like today's rap music has a certain sound to it, as we said in an earlier lecture. In the sonnet writing, you're going to have a certain kind of understanding in regards to the rules of the game, and then they try to be creative within the rules. I would write that down at 2B. That's the goal of these guys, to be creative within the rules. People who don't know rap say it all sounds the same, which is, of course, ludicrous. I hope you got the point. But the reality is that there is a certain kind of foundational sound within rap to make it rap. You got me? The same is true for sonnet writing. There's a certain kind of sound. There's a certain kind of series of rules, and we just want to make sure that you got that. And a sonnet sequence, let's write that one down at 2B. Sonnet sequence, sonnets are linked by theme or person addressed. In other words, it's a group of them. Comparing literary works, notable writers of the Elizabethan age, such as Spencer and Sidney, made their mark by writing sonnet sequences. To connect 100 or more poems without growing dull, they used a basic 
fictional situation, and here is that fictional situation. The speaker in the sequence is deeply in love, but his love is often unfulfilled. In other words, unrequited love is going to be behind, standing behind a lot of these sonnets that we're, that we're studying. All right? As you read, compare Spencer and Sidney's use of this basic situation. In regards to the reading strategy, let's take a look at that one really quickly. To better understand what you read, determine the main idea or essential message, what we would call 2A, what we would call 2A, of literary works or passages. For instance, you can determine the main idea of a passage of poetry by paraphrasing it or restating it in your own words. First, read the passage to find a complete thought. Then separate the essential from the non-essential information and express the essential information in your own language. You can use a chart like the one right there that you're looking at to kind of help you. Again, hey, 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 let me just pause for a moment. I know I've said this many times in 303. I'm happy you're here. And I'm happy by the time you graduate and leave 303, you're going to know a lot about British literature. But that is not why you are here, first and foremost. The primary reason you're here is so I can help you learn to read. Why is that important? Because once you leave high school... Whatever it is you're doing after high school, whether it be academic situations, whether it be military situations, whether it be work situations, whether it be tech school situations, you're going to have to read. You're going to have to read. So I'm challenging you here as we meet these poems, which are going to be kind of difficult, to try to actually learn how to read using some of this stuff. One of the ways I've often said this is if you can get through crap like this at college, you'll be able to read any history or any psychology, any sociology or any anthropology or biology pretty easily because this is some pretty complicated language, okay? So, a system helps you. That is to say the annotative approach. Finally, I would hope that you've taken a look at these six vocab words at the bottom of 252. I can absolutely guarantee you they're going to end up on the exam and they will help us obviously in the reading of the poems. Hey, jump over to 253 really quickly. There's a picture of the guy that we're looking, that we're reading, all right? By the way, we will start to see portraits. Did you notice this? Up to this point in our textbook, we haven't seen very many real drawings. Have you noticed this? Because there aren't really many, very many of them available. From about 1600 on, we start to see lots and lots of these guys. They will have professional painters paint them. Think about, in your senior year, the importance of a senior photograph, right? You spend a lot of time making sure that you get the correct senior photograph that will appear in the annual. Why? Because you know 25 years from now, right, you're going to look back at that senior photograph and you're going to say, that was me then. And of course, there's going to be somebody much younger than you who's going to say, whoa, that's not at all what you look like now. Don't worry, it's coming. It's inevitable. And so you try and pick the best picture you can. You're going to see pictures of these guys all the way through. You can obviously get some sense as well of maybe like fashion statements sometimes with the way they dress. Let's go ahead and look at Spencer. Write down first his dates, 1552 to 1599. So go ahead and write that down really quickly. Again, I'm a, I, like, I like easy round dates, which is why if you're talking about the English Renaissance and the Elizabethan poets, I like the date 1600. I like the date 1600, just because it's an easy round date. You can obviously go 1550 if you want, and that obviously kind of captures uh, at least the beginning of, of Spencer's life. But I like 1600. By 1600, Spencer's already dead, but people know his stuff, right? And what is his stuff? Well, let's take a look at it. Born into a working class family, Edmund Spencer attended the Merchant Taylor School on a scholarship and managed to work his way through Cambridge University, relatively bright. During his university years, Spencer published his first poems. Pay for poetry. Unlike many other poets of the day, Spencer depended on the payments he received for his work. When the queen's treasurer balked at paying him, he sent this verse to the queen, quote, I was promised on a time to have reason for my rhyme. From that time unto this season, I have received nor rhyme nor reason, end quote. Spencer was paid immediately. The fairy queen. Do you see that heading? Please write that down at 3A. Hyper, hyper critical. It's one of the challenges of our class together in the senior year, that there's whole titles I cannot talk about because we just don't have time. Fairy Queen is one of them. Let's look at it. In 1580, I would write this down. In 1580, Spencer took a position as a secretary to the Lord Deputy of Ireland. On a visit to Ireland in 1589, Sir Walter Raleigh, we're going to meet him later, read and was impressed with one of Spencer's unfinished poems. He persuaded Spencer to take the first three books of this long poem to London for publication. The poem became Spencer's greatest book, The Fairy Queen. So let's write it down. The most famous single work by Spencer is called The Fairy Queen. Written in an intentionally archaic style, The Fairy Queen recounts the adventures of several knights each representing a virtue, this allegory of good and evil dedicated to Queen Elizabeth I, who appears as the fairy queen in the poem, brought Spencer a small pension. So in other words, he makes him some money. A poet's poet. 
Spencer was an innovative poet. In The Fairy Queen, he created a new type of nine-line stanza, which was later named for him. He also created a sonnet form known as the Spencerian Sonnet, containing a unique structure and rhyme scheme. His sonnet uh, sequence, Amorte, is unique among such works. It is addressed to the poet's own wife, not some inaccessible, idealized beauty. So let's go ahead and make a point. Many of the poems we will study, Spencer wrote specifically to his wife. Okay. Notice the quote here, the noblest mind, the best contentment has. Well, let's take a look at sonnet number one. We'll turn the page now to 254, and we're going to work with, with the first of the sonnets. We'll read this uh, sonnet by Spencer. This one, let's go ahead and write it down. It does come from Amorte, which for Italian means little love poem. So write that down, please. The sonnet sequence is unique in that it's addressed to the poet's wife, Elizabeth Boyle, not to some distant, unattainable, or unrequited love. In Spencer's sonnet, his love inspires the speaker's poetry and the speaker's claims that he suffers because he cannot focus on anything but his beloved. However, the poet's triumph will be to immortalize her in verse, and we'll see this in the three poems that we're looking at. Let's look first at Sonnet 1. Let's just read the poem, and by the way, these are just numbered. They're not going to give any titles other than that, but hey, 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 can I say this for your notes? This is huge. On the exam, we will reference these poems as they are called in the book. That is to say, Sonnet 1, Sonnet 35, whatever. So make sure that you have an appropriate way to memorize the titles of these different poems because it can become problematic when you'll have, I think on the exam, we have over 15 of these different sonnets that you have to respond to on the exam. So make sure you've got some way to study, all right? Let's take a look at it, Sonnet 1. Hey, just read along with me. See if you can keep up. See if you can focus and hear what it is that we're saying. Sonnet 1. Happy ye leaves, when as those lily hands which hold my life in their dead doing might, shall handle you and hold in love's soft bands like captives trembling at the victor's sight. And happy lines on which with starry light those lamping eyes will deign sometimes to look, and read the sorrows of thy dying sprite, written with tears in heart's closed, bleeding book. And happy rhymes bathed in the sacred brook of Halcyon whence she derived is. When ye behold that angel's blessed look, my soul's long lacked food, my heaven's bliss. Leaves, lines, and rhymes Seek her to please alone, whom, if ye please, I care for other none. Now, I want to hop over really quickly to the world literature and context box. Do you see it right to the left? Francesco Petrar, father of the sonnet. Let's write down his dates, 1304 to 1374. Notice the dates difference. If we use 1600 as a round working date for Spencer, then notice that we're talking about, in Petrar, 1300. So we're talking about 300 years earlier, which is roughly the age of our country, right? We're talking about that amount of time has transpired since the sonnet form was first constructed. Let's read it really quickly. The 16th century English sonnet was inspired by an Italian tradition. 200 years earlier, Petrarch, a scholar and poet from near Florence, Italy, had written his famous songbook, a sonnet sequence or linked group of sonnets dedicated to a woman named Laura. Petrarch did not invent the sonnet form, but he perfected it, giving his name to the Petrarchian sonnet based on an octave and a sextet, rhyming A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, and then, of course, the C, D, E, C, D, E, or sometimes um, C, D, C, C, D, C. I'm sorry, C, D, C, D, C, D. I apologize. He also created the sonnet sequence and wrote his lyrics in everyday Italian rather than Latin, the literary language of the time, thereby making his poetry far more popular to the people of the street. The first thing we want to do at 2B with this sonnet number one is to ask, is it a sonnet? Of course, we know it is a sonnet, but let's remind ourselves what makes it a sonnet. First of all, does it have 14 lines? Take a look and see. Does it have 14 lines? Of course, the way quickly you'll know that is the numbering of the lines. Do you see the number 10 and then there's four lines beyond it? Do you see it on the left-hand side? Number two, does it have a rhyme scheme at the end lines? Well, let's take a look. Hands, 
Are you looking at it with me? At line one, rhymes with bands. Do you see it at the end of line three? Okay. Might, at the end of line two, rhymes with sight and light. Do you see it? Look rhymes with book and brook. Do you see it? Okay, so this is an intentional rhyme scheme. Now, the way this normally works, as we've already said in an earlier lecture, is that when you get to the end of the first line, you write the letter A. If the last word of the second line rhymes with the letter A word, then you'll also write a little letter A. But if it doesn't, you'll keep reading. When you see the next one, that is to say hands and bands, right, that would be the letter A. That is why we will call this A, B, A, if we're talking about the first three lines. Okay, so we definitely have rhyme scheme here. Let's take a look, though, at the final part of what makes an, uh, an Elizabethan sonnet, what we call iambic pentameter. Ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. Right? Okay? A pair of star cars lovers take their lives. Do you remember those lines from Romeo and Juliet? Right? We've, we've already pointed this out in a lecture. Shakespeare writes the majority of Romeo and Juliet in iambic pentameter. A pair of star cars lovers take their life. A pair of star cross lovers take their life. Ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. That iambic pentameter, that is to say iambic ba-bum, right? Stress on stress. As well as five of them, pent means five. Ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum, ba bum. So let's ask if we see this here. For example, happy ye leaves when as those lily hands. Slow it down, scansion. Slow it down, scan it. Happy ye leaves when as those lily hands. Watch my hands. Happy ye leaves when as those lily hands, which hold my life in their dead doing might shall handle you and hold in love's soft bands like captives trembling at the victor's sight. Ba-bum, 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 ba-bum. So let's point out, this is an Elizabethan sonnet using iambic pentameter, okay? Now that is a level 2B observation. Now what we want to do is to actually look at the poem and try and figure out what exactly is it that he's saying as he works through these different words. Let's read an exegete now, and we'll take a few lines at a time, and we'll try and write down at level one what actually is being said here. And hey, 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 for those of you who are college-bound, trust me, the work you're doing right now is vital to learning how to become a better reader. How do you take a bit of passage from a history textbook, college, a psychology textbook, college, a biology textbook, college, and be able to read it and understand it on your own? Answer. You take a small section, put it in your own words, paraphrase. Take another small section, paraphrase, put it in your own words. Let's play the game now. Let's see how well we do, all right? Notice he begins. Happy ye leaves, when as those lily hands, white lily hands, which hold my life in their dead doing might, that is to say their killing might, shall handle you and hold in love's soft bands like captives trembling at their victor's sight. In other words, he says the following. It's as if somehow, he has a word picture of somebody who's about to be captured and sees it coming. We have already then the feeling, let's write it down, of the emotion of some fear, some worry, right? Some concern. Notice he says, it's almost like love is holding me captive. Let's write that down. Love is holding me captive. Love for who? For the woman, obviously, that he is writing all these poems for. In other words, he is using the poetry to try to tell the girl how much he loves her. How much he loves her. And happy lines on which, I'm at line five. Happy lines on which with starry light those lamping, that is to say flashing eyes, will dine sometimes to look. In other words, every once in a while, the girl looks at me, right? And read the sorrows of my dying sprite, that is to say spirit, written with tears in heart's closed bleeding book. Secret, in other words. In other words, here I am writing in secret. I want to let her know how much I love her. And I'm hoping that she will somehow be able to respect the fact that I love her so much. And happy rhymes bathed in the sacred book of Helcyon, your footnote will tell you in Greek mythology, this is the mountain home of the muses, goddesses of the arts, 
whence she derived is. In other words, he says about his girl, she came from the gods. Let's write that down. He's giving her a compliment. When she reads this, she obviously will, he will say to her, you know what? When the gods got together to make the most beautiful thing in the world, you know who they made? They made you. Ha <laughs> ha. Of halcyon whence she derived it is, when ye behold that angel's blessed look, my soul's long lacked food, my heaven's bliss. In other words, he says, all I need in my life to be able to write good poetry is to have my girl. If I have my girl, I have everything. Now, of course, students who are kind of believers in love or want to be believers in love will say, now this is a pretty sweet sentiment. It's a way to say to your girl, I really care for you because you are the reason, the muse, the motivation for me to write poetry. You can kind of understand why this would be the very first sonnet in a sonnet sequence. In other words, I'm going to write some sonnets. I'm going to write some lines. Two things about that. One, I'm going to write them in celebration of you and your beauty. And I'm going to tell you how much I love you through my writing of these lines of poetry. Okay? Notice how we finish. Leaves, lines, and rhymes seek her to please alone. Whom, if ye please, I care for other none. In other words, he says, there's only one thing in my life I want to do, and that's please you. I'm going to write these poems, and I'm going to give them to you, and I hope that you are pleased by this. Okay? Now let's jump quickly to 3A, just to finish our annotation of this poem. It's an interesting question to ask. Do you think it is the case that artists who create have to have some motivation called the muse. Is there a movie for you? Is there a song for you? Is there a video for you that makes you think about the idea that everything the guy does is because of the girl? Everything the guy does is because he's totally into the girl and he hopes that he can somehow please her. What is your favorite movie where the guy doesn't please the girl and it ruins his life? Do you have a movie like